Eric, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time. You got it. Thanks for having me, Danny. Yeah. So I feel like we should start off with April of 2020 when you're telling professional athletes to lift bottles of water and <laughs> soup cans. What was that experience like? Uh, it was interesting. Uh, you know, I think it was, um, you know, kind of felt like you were in a, a, a sink that was shipping and you were just bailing water out, uh, you know, as the boat continued to take on water, um, just because we had a lot of different moving parts, right? Certainly, you know, we wanted to make sure, you know, both of our facilities were taken care of. We wanted to make sure, you know, that our, that our employees were still, in, you know, still compensated and able to, to get by. We want to make sure that our athletes didn't just kind of detrain after putting in a lot of hard work over the off seasons. And, you know, so we had a lot of, of, you know, clients that, you know, were, were not sure that they were going to continue to receive a paycheck through, you know, professional baseball. We had college students that weren't necessarily, uh, you know, getting to have a season. And, and on top of that, we had three kids that, you know, two of whom would normally have been in school were, were homeschooling at the time. And so it was a, it was an interesting time to be a, be an entrepreneur. And then, you know, even on the professional side, we had players that kind of scattered all over the world. You know, we had players that were in Japan and Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic, you name it. Um, they didn't all just kind of stay put right where they were. So that was, um, it was definitely a challenging time, but, you know, made it made us stronger for sure. Yeah. So take me through your initial thoughts when I guess the, the pandemic started and you have sports leagues closing down, what are you thinking? What's going through your mind and how did that progress? Yeah, I think like a lot of us, um, you know, I, I didn't know what to think, you know, I don't think there's a playbook for a pandemic cause we've never been through it before, but you know, it was interesting. I was, I was with the team. Um, they actually happened to be on the East coast of Florida when it, when it happened and, you know, kind of just watching it, you know, play out as the, the NBA stuff started to happen. And, you know, the sports center was on the locker room pregame and you just start to realize, all right, this is a lot more serious than, you know, the NBA, I think ended their, their season or, or postponed their season. And, um, you know, we went out and played a game right afterwards and, you know, you know, packed house with you know, 13 or 15,000 people in the stands, however many it was. And, you know, as the game went on, it became pretty clear, like, Hey, this is probably the last play game we're going to play for quite a while. And, um, it was a, it was a weird time. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that I had like an impression. It was more just, there were so many things to do that you just kind of had to roll the punches and you wound up exhausted at the end of the day and you turn on the news and try to figure out what's going on in the world every night. And, um, you know, and that was the time too, or, you know, they were telling us to like, you know, wipe off your groceries and let them sit overnight before you put them in your, you know, you just didn't know what to make of it. And sure. You know, we got a lot more information and everything, but like everybody else, I was, I think I was a casual observer to the world of epidemiology. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people are coming to you at this time as well. Like, can I do this? Can I do that? How do you deal with the imperfect answers you may have, because we all have imperfect knowledge and then forcing to give information to people who want information from you specifically. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you always, and this is something that served me well in my career. I think honesty is the best policy. You know, you direct with people. Um, and, and I don't think you're ever afraid to admit that you don't know. And, and I think that serves you well, whether you're talking about a pandemic or, you know, other aspects of the world. But, you know, I, I think if there's anything that maybe 2020 and 2021 reminded us of is there, there are stressors. And, you know, how you respond to that stressor is just as important as what the initial, you know, kind of stimulus is. So, you know, I, I think it probably gave us a, a lot of appreciation for some of the things that we complain about, maybe weren't quite as bad as we, we made them out to be in the past. And, you know, during those, those months, there were, there were a lot of people that were really struggling to put food on the table. And there were people that, you know, obviously very, very sick and, you know, lost loved ones. So I, I think it put a lot of things into context for us. Hmm. So I'd like to go back to your master's thesis, which was the effects of 10 weeks of lower body unstable surface training on markers of athletic performance. How did you come to this master's thesis and what did you learn? Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I think it was a, a little bit of a function of the time. You know, it was, you know, it was actually executed. My, or my master's degree was done between 2003 and 2005. So really proposed it in 2003 and did the data collection in the spring of 2005 and, you know, finalized all the thesis submissions and, and defended it in, in 05. And it actually wasn't even published till 2007. So it's kind of a, kind of an eye-opening thing that we're talking about start to finish. It's a four-year process to get, you know, some of this important research out in the world. But I think it was just a time when, um, you know, a lot of the implements that were out on the market were becoming more and more popular. Um, you know, there were classes being taught with them and they were kind of being, you know, put out there as this end all be all this, you know, 
thing that could fix everything for everybody. Um, and we just wanted to see, you know, what was the, what was the role of some of these unstable service training implements? Um, you know, did they, you know, serve a lot of value? And what we knew is um, at that time that there was clearly value in the context of rehabilitating functional ankle instability. Um, so we know the overwhelming majority of ankle sprains tend to be lateral ankle sprains and and a lot of those people, after they have these injuries, they develop appropriate receptive delay of the peroneal muscle group. So the muscle on the outside of the shin, they just don't fire as quickly as they need to fire to prevent you from spraining your ankle again. And, and they've shown that, you know, you do some unstable surface training on, um, you know, in the rehabilitation timelines after these injuries. And, and you know, sure enough, it helps to address that proprioceptive delay and, and reduce your incidence of, of rolling your ankle again. Um, so that's all well and good. And I think you know, what, what wound up becoming ha uh, an issue is people took those, uh, those messages from the clinical population and we started throwing them at healthy athletes. And, and we realized that, you know, there are, there are different adjustments that take place in a healthy athlete versus an injured one. Um, you know, there are different competencies that need to be developed and, you know, and there's probably a point where you transition from being quote unquote hurt to being quote unquote healthy. Um, and, you know, so our, our research looked at this and, what I think was really, really important is that we simulated how these things were actually used in the real world. So rarely did you see someone who did all of their stuff on unstable service training, right? More often it was, you know, at least in the context of what I was interested in, it was, you know, athletes that would do, you know, maybe 90 or 95% of their training volume, you know, squat, bench, you know, clean, deadlift, lunge, whatever it may be. And then, you know, this would be kind of just some ancillary work, um, you know, similar to what you might do with someone who rolled an ankle three years ago and, you wanted to just do some proactive stuff to make sure it didn't come back. And so we only replaced about two to 3% of their overall training volume in our experimental group, uh, you know, with unstable surface stuff. And then what we also did was we, we did a control group that, you know, basically matched for volume um, and did those same exercises on stable surface. So instead of doing a split squat on a, you know, on a unstable surface, we just did it, you know, regular on the ground. And um, what was interesting is at the end of the study, we found that, um, you know, basically even two to 3% of your training volume on unstable surfaces actually attenuated your improvements in, in, in power tests. So, you know, we had several different power tests that we use as part of that jumps and sprints. And we found that both groups improved. Um, but you know, the group that didn't even go near unstable surfaces improved more. So there was, there was clearly an attenuation and, and, you know, what, there were a lot of different potential hypotheses for it um, that we outlined in, in the write-up. But what, what I think was probably the most significant is when you go to unstable surfaces, you, you, get, you get comparable actual muscular recruitment, but it's actually done more for joint stability than it does for actual, you know, uh, joint torque. So moving a, a joint to a different position. Um, and joint stability can be super helpful. You know, particularly if we're talking about the upper extremity that operates in really like a lot of open chain exercise and things like that, um, where maybe we need to stabilize joints that are inherently more mobile. Um, we look at the lower extremity, we work almost exclusively in closed chain motion. Um, you know, we stand on the ground, it doesn't move on us, we move on it. Um, and, and when you look at how you actually develop force, it's a combination of a few things, but it's, it's, the, it's the power of the agonist but it's also the inhibition of the antagonists. So one of the adaptations that take place as we get stronger and more powerful is it's, it's not just that muscles doing the work work better, it's that the ones opposing that work learn to relax better. And I think we put somebody on unstable surfaces, sometimes we create a hesitant athlete. We increase you know, that antagonist co-contraction and it might be great for joint stability. It might not be great if we wanna run fast, jump high, you know, and, and, and do very, very athletic things. So. Um, you know, the, the point of the, the study was not, I mean, there, there wasn't a point in the study. It was to, it was to test a hypothesis, but, you know, I think the takeaway from it was, you know, what works for injured athletes doesn't necessarily work for healthy athletes and make sure if you're going to use these, that you understand why you would use them, um, you know, and then, you know, plan accordingly. Something that I noticed from hearing you talk and by going into your, the things that you put out on a daily basis is how much you are influenced by the body and how much you are looking at particular elements of the body and breaking them down to the level that obviously the normal person has never done. When did you start to have an interest in the body at such a particular level? Yeah, I think, you know, as I look back on this, what's funny is uh, a lot of people don't know this is when I first went to college, I actually thought I was going to be an accountant. Um, wow. <laughs> joke. I went to this, I went to the state accounting championships as a senior in high school. Um, so one of the things about accounting that appealed to me was that it was very 
black and white. You know, I'm, I'm sure that don't get me wrong. I'm sure there are accounts that view things as very, very gray. But for me, I I enjoyed math. I, I was good at math, and you know, I I, I felt like it came naturally to me because of that mindset. Um, and I, I think that was maybe one of the appeals when I, when I switched and went to the exercise science world was that anatomy never lies. You know, I mean, it's, you know, yes, they're anatomical variants, like, you know, one in 500 people has a cervical rib and, you know, you'll, you'll see different kinds of attachment points and some people have, you know, short tendons and long muscle bellies. And some people have, you know, long, you know, uh, tendons and short muscle bellies. But the, the point is that, it, you know, the general principles were very much the same is if you understood structure, you could use your head and figure out function. You could see what needed to happen. And in turn, you know, function would drive dysfunction. And if you understood those pathways, um, you could always realize there was an anatomical basis for movement. So, um, you know, for me, I think it just spoke to my, my more type A, willing to memorize boring stuff uh, mindset. And it, it, it's, it's definitely served me well over the years. What was the reason for that change from accounting to the body as yeah. a whole, I'll put it? It was interesting. I, so I actually, uh, I was a, I was a tennis player and a soccer player in high school. Um, and I, I make no, make no mistake about it. I was a fantastically mediocre athlete. Like we, nowadays I do this and, you know, we'll have like, you know, adult clients that come in and they're training alongside our pro guys. And it's like, man, if I had just had this when I was 14, I would have been a big leaguer. It's like, no, you wouldn't have. These guys are so much better than you were. Like if I had had good training, I probably could have been like a, a good division two athlete. Um, but I was a, I was an okay soccer and tennis player. I got recruited to play division three in both of those. Um, and tennis was basically off the, the option list. Cause my shoulder was pretty torn up for my high school tennis career. And, um, so my, you know, kind of end of senior year of, of soccer, one of the big knocks on me was that I wasn't really fast. I had good ball skills. I was more quick, kind of understood the game pretty well. Um, but I, I, I wasn't fast. So I, I kind of took it upon myself to get in much better shape. And really over the course of my senior year, I, I put myself in a tough spot health wise, uh, lost a lot of weight, kind of little, you know, exercise addiction slash eating disorder. Um, and, and really made myself pretty sick. Um, actually had some hospitalizations and, um, you know, became, you know, as much psychological as it was physical. And, and so, you know, that kind of scrapped my, my hope of college soccer, but in the process, I, I learned a lot about my body in terms of what I needed to be healthy to gain weight back the right way. Um, you know, and, and also rehabilitate my shoulder. So those first couple of years of, of college, uh, was spent kind of realizing that this was something I was more passionate about. And over the course of going through it, I actually developed some skills that, you know, had served me well. So sure enough, I, I transferred the university of New England, um, from Babson college where I'd been and double major in exercise science and sports and fitness management. And then, uh, went on to the university of Connecticut for my graduate degree and, you know, the rest is history, but, um, you know, it was more life experiences that kind of set me up for some of that stuff. Why do you think you took yourself that far? to go to the level of eating disorder and go to the level of hospitalization, what was driving you? And why do you think that started in your, in your career? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's, there's obviously tons and tons of theories out there from, from people who are, who are much brighter than I am. I've studied it really intensely, but from my own personal experiences, I think, you know, I think we have people who are, who, who have obsessive compulsive disorder, right? And I'm, I'm OCD. And, and I think, what we see often with with young people who maybe go through some of this stuff is um, they're always just trying to find control wherever they can. You know, we we see it for you know athletes who can they can always just run more or eat less or lift more or whatever it is. You know, we see other people that um, you know wind up with eating disorders who may be in abusive relationships or have issues with substance abuse or whatever. And and food is in many cases something that they can they can always control. Um, so I think that is a, a, you know, a vitally important part of that discussion. Um, you know, and for me, I was a, you know, I was a high academic kid who was putting a lot of pressure on myself in terms of where I wanted to play in school and, and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I couldn't control what coaches necessarily thought, but I could control what I put into it. So um, I think you just, you put a lot of pressure on yourself and, you know, you keep pushing the bar a lot higher. And, and what I've done is I'm still very OCD. I'm still a crazy workaholic. I, you know, and I think if you ask most people that I've interact with me, it's, I still work an absurd number of hours, but I've learned to make it work for me. Um, I've learned how to figure it out as part of my lifestyle where it's, it's go, 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 go on whatever I'm doing, but then have other things, have wife, have kids, uh, have an ability to decompress where appropriate. And, um, you know, so I've just, I've kind of harnessed it over the course of time and, and taken a lot of the stuff that I use to, 
you know, to, to, to lose weight and train crazy hard and, you know, manipulate diet and instead I've applied it to some professional endeavors and being a good dad and husband. Yeah. For people listening, he's not kidding about working hard because he worked 4,511 straight days over <laughs> the course of, I don't know, 12 years. So pretty incredible stuff. But going back to the, the eating disorder, what would you say to the, the same kid that you were at 17, 18? What would you say to him today about, about that situation? I think for me, um, the device that, that ultimately benefited me, it was, um, you know, the, the mix is different for everybody, right? Just like training, right? If, if you and I both have the same goal, there might be markedly different ways for us to attain that, right? You see people that get crazy strong lifting two days a week and others that need to lift four. You see people that can, you know, shed 50 pounds by going low carb, others that, you know, eat high carb. And, and, and there's many different ways to endeavor. And like, for me, um, I really didn't kick some of my issues back then until I was actually introduced to someone in the strength and conditioning field. Um, he's a guy who's a former competitive bodybuilder and, you know, done some work with the U S Olympic committee he actually had opened a gym in my hometown. And, you know, I think I, I, I always viewed myself much more as a, as a confused athlete, someone that, that really needed direction. I was a high motivation, you know, but confused athlete. And I think he saw that in me and gave me direction, but more importantly, he walked the walk. You know, he was a guy who was fit, you know, he was a, he was a father himself. He still trained regularly, ate well. And, and I wanted to be shown how to done it, how to do it. Um, I just didn't want someone in like, um, sitting behind a desk telling me how I should live my life. And I always saw through a lot of those. And, you know, some of those folks were dietitians, some of those folks were counselors. Um, I, I always wanted to be treated like an athlete. And I think in a lot of those, you know, therapeutic settings, things like that, I struggled with it. And, and that, that, solution may be entirely different for someone else. Um, you know, it just, it wasn't the right fit for me. Um, and, and we, you know, my parents and I definitely struggled with it for a couple of years and I, I probably gave them some gray hairs in the process. And, um, but you know, it, it worked out for the best, you know, in the long term. So take me through that situation with how did you find help for this situation and what was it specifically about this person that helped you and how did they help you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, believe it or not, he was actually new to town and my, my neighbor uh, kind of met him and learned about him a little bit and actually walked over one door and one day and, and told my mom about it. And I was like, you know, I can get behind this. And sure enough, he was working out of like a little podunk gym that's actually still, you know, it's grown and, and is, is you know pretty well known in my community now back in, in, in Maine. But he was a guy that just, um, like I said, when I went in and met with him, he had a calm, collected way about him. Um, you didn't tell me how it was supposed to be listened to what I had to say, what was frustrating me, what I wanted to learn and, um, and provided some mentorship and, you know, didn't like con a lot of times when you're in those situations, when you're, when you're struggling with health and, and learning nutrition, the first thing I want to do is shut you down from exercise. Um, you know, you'd be shocked. Like, you know, they, they see a, you know, someone who's in that situation and they'll, they'll hospitalize them, throw in wheelchairs, whatever it may be. And, you know, for me, I, I wanted to exercise. I wanted to eat to support it. I just needed to be demonstrated how, and what was actually cool about it was, you know, it, there was a, there was a scalable way to it. It wasn't just like, all right, go to, go to counseling, gain weight, and then you're healthy. It's like, no, like he actually saw it as a way that, you know, this is something I was interested in doing as a career. Um, and so he took me under his wing and, you know, I started working the front desk at the gym after a while, just, you know, falling in love with it. And, um, you know, it became a very collaborative relationship instead of just a doctor telling you what to do. And, um, you know, like I said, for, and I never want to like, you know, say that my way is the right way for everyone. Cause I, like I said, I think the mix is a little bit different for everybody, but it, it did help me tremendously to, to get where I am. Mm. Yeah, that that's incredible. And I think that everyone needs to find their own path and that's great that you found yours that way. I want to fast forward to you taking someone under your wing which was Jordan Syatt. And I asked him, you know, what do you remember about working with Eric Cressy? And he said the following, listening to him coach on the floor, the cues he'd give athletes, small things, even just how he'd speak to the clients and alter their training on the fly if needed. I was very young and that experience and the attention to detail shaped how I coached dramatically. That's Jordan Syatt in response to how you impacted him. So how does that make you feel, first of all? And and talk me through the relationship you and Jordan had. Yeah, for sure. I think um, yeah, it's it's flattering. And I think the world of Jordan, we still, we still text and talk regularly. So um, you know, I always say that, you know, above all else, like we're we're a third place for clients, right? There's there's home, there's 
work or school. And then there's here. We want people to not just come and exercise here. We want to feel like it's a community and it's a, it's a third place they can go. That's going to be the best part of their day. Um, but I always say, you know, if we're not a training facility, we're a teaching facility. And, you know, Jordan obviously has done phenomenal things in, in his, you know, working life and has had a profound impact on, you know, a lot of other people that he's coached. And, you know, we have people that have won World Series rings. We have people that are, you know, directors of performance in the NBA and NHL. We have people that are doing cool stuff in the military, folks that are, you know, have gone to physical therapy school. We have folks that are, you know, medical school, you name it. Um, so they've gone from all walks of life from our internship program. So I'm, I'm, I'm always at the end of the day, I think just as proud of those guys and, and girls uh, as I am of, of just our athletes, um, because I, I feel like they're going to have the trickle down effect is, you know, what we teach here is going to impact, you know, them in some way where they'll be able to impart wisdom and, you know, quality of life and, you know, some kind of a, you know, a third place for, for other people. So I think that's where maybe you have the, the biggest trickle down work in your career. So, I mean, it's, it certainly means a lot. That was very flattering to hear from Jordan. And, um, you know, he's obviously done well and represented us well in the real world. And, you know, to his credit, man, he, he had thick skin. We, he got his chops busted pretty good because Jordan's not a big guy. And he came in, he was coaching a bunch of, you know, six foot three, six foot four, you know, professional baseball players and stuff. And, you know, they'll, they'll give it out for you. And, and he was, he was a little naive back in the day and has grown up a ton since then, but we, we love Jordan. He's, he's a, he's a part of the CSB family for good. What do you look for in potential interns or bringing people under your wing? Because Jordan mentioned that you make fun of or, or laugh at applications people write where they clearly didn't proofread it. But other than that, what are you looking for in a potential intern? Yeah. So the, the, the first thing I would ask you is, you know, you, you always, or I would tell, would tell you is you, you always look for the small hinges that swing big doors. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have some former interns who listen to this and be like, Oh, that's a Cressyism. That's a line I use, but you know, like it, it, there are certain things that tip you off to someone not having good attention to detail. So I, I do believe our, our job is incredibly important. We coach something wrong. People get hurt. That, that could dramatically impact their quality of life. Heck you, you can do things wrong and people could die. Right. Um, this is an important role. So you always want to make sure that people have attention to detail. And so one of the things that we'll actually do is we'll, we'll, we'll build some of those tripwires into our application process. Um, and I, I won't tell you exactly what our tripwires because I don't want to <laughs> give it away, but there's very specific directions um, in the way that you submit even just your paperwork for an internship. Um, it's outlined, it's highlighted, it's underlined, you name it, it's a different color, all that stuff. And it's, it's done for a couple of reasons. One, it, it saves us time if they follow the directions. But two, it tells us who actually does follow the directions. Um, because if you're not going to pay attention to that side of things, chances are down the road, it's not going to work well for you either here. If, you know, so we, we can eliminate about 40% of applicants just from how they submit. Um, and, and just being honest, for the first time, really in the last nine years, we opened up a position externally. Normally we hire exclusively from our internship program, but we opened up you know, one externally got over a hundred applications in a matter of like two weeks. And you know, we, we made our hire, but it was amazing how many of them didn't even get past the first email just because their cover letters were so horrifically written um, or, or they just, you know, didn't, didn't approach it the right way. You, you, you'd be shocked at how many cover letters you get that are addressed to a different job. They don't even change the name at the top of the, the letter. So it's just, it's attention to detail. Show me that you want to work here. Show me that you want to be part of a team. Show me that you want to be part of something bigger than just yourself. Um, you know, another thing that I'll, I'll tell you is, is actually a huge turnoff to our, uh, you know, among our applicants that we, we leverage really heavily is um, to be honest, like with all the stuff I have going on, I, I don't look at the applications. Um, you know, I'll be involved on kind of the final selection process, but actually um, we have internship coordinators, Andrew Lacey in, in Florida and John O'Neill in Massachusetts. And then my business partner, Pete, kind of organizes all the initial logistics. So those three see all of the resumes and applications and cover letters. I don't even see those until we're in the final hour. Um, and what's interesting, a lot of times people will write a, a cover letter that says, Oh, I've been reading Eric's work since 2011. I love Eric's stuff. I can't wait to learn from Eric. But like, hey, you know what? We got a lot of really smart people on our team who are awesome. And honestly, like they're probably going to spend a lot more time with you than, than I can, right? I have three kids and 
you know, I'm running two facilities, living between two states. I'm working as a director of player health and performance for, you know, a major league organization. There's a lot of moving parts here. Like you're like, I'm not going to be the kind of, it teaches you how to do a trap bar deadlift on your first week of your internship. So, you know, we want them to embrace this concept of like, this is not Eric Cressy. This is, this is Cressy sports performance. And it's one of the reasons why, honestly, I regret putting my name on the business um, because it undermines how important all, all those, you know, staff members are and, and, and business partners. Um, so, you know, not following the directions and then being like an Eric fanboy, those are kind of our, some of our two biggest pet peeves and, and they're easy ways to differentiate yourself in all this. Do you ever look at your life and see how many things you have your hands in, in the pot of and say, wow, how did this happen? Um, I, my wife will, be the first to test. I, I tend to be really terrible at like taking time to smell the roses. Um, and that's part of the, probably the OCD in me is, you know, going from one thing to the next and navigating them, I think reasonably well, but, um, yeah, I mean, there are certainly times in, in more so I, you know, I think one of the things that I've gotten good at over the years is I, I say no a lot more. Um, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way. It's just that you, you can't be everything to everyone all the time. Um, you know, so really probably where that's cut back the most is I'm doing fewer like speaking engagements than ever before. That was, you know, one of the things that I, I basically got rid of, um, when I decided to, you know, to, to, you know, sign on with the Yankees and, and do more travel and all that stuff is if I'm going to be away, you know, for that, I can't also be away from my family to, to go and do every seminar that comes my way. And what's nice is it actually kind of coincided with when, when the world went webinar based and zoom took off. So I, I've been able to, to do more of that stuff. So literally like last weekend, I was on a, a webinar from eight to 10 PM Friday and Saturday nights with my stuff translated to Japanese live from across the world. So, you know, I think that's made it a lot easier to scale, um, some of our interaction with, with people around the world. How do you think about figuring out new opportunities to work on and work for? It's like, I'm sure so many things come across your desk at this point. Well, how do you make that decision of like, yes, I'm going to work for the Yankees in this capacity, or yes, I'm going to do this podcast with this random person named Danny Brent. How do you, how do you decide? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's always people, right? That's, that's the first and foremost step because it, the people that you're, you're working with are the ones that, that either make it enjoyable or make it miserable. Like it's very rarely just a collection of circumstances, right? Like, so you know, we blew out a tire yesterday on the ride back from New York with the kids in the backseat. Like that's nobody's fault. Right. Um, but you know what, if, if you take on a job, you know, and you know, the people you didn't do your homework on, then, you know, it's, it, it could work out poorly for you. So I think, you know, for me, that's always been the number one thing is when I evaluate new opportunities, are these people that, you know, I want to work with, um, are they people that, you know, are, are, are trustable, you know, are trustworthy, I should say, you know, do they make the right decisions? Will they represent the brand? Like, you know, so if I went and I looked at your podcast before I came on and you were dropping an F-bomb every other word and, you know, it just, it wasn't in line with who I am as a person and it, you know, it didn't show me any kind of upside, then, you know, it's probably not a good fit. Obviously you, you came by Jordan and he's someone who's, you know, value I, or whose opinion I value and have a long-term relationship and all that stuff. So yeah, it's something I can do, but um, I think, I think it comes down to people. And then, you know, even still, you, sometimes you, you turn down stuff with, with good people just because you know, you, your family always comes first. And that's something that I, I think I've done over the years. And, you know, it's, it's just this concept of opportunity cost. You know, what else could you be doing with your time? Um, certain times of the year, I, I can do podcasts easier. I can do seminars easier. It, you probably wouldn't have gotten me for a podcast between October 1st and February 15th. It just wouldn't have happened. Um, and I, I run my own podcast. And you know, one of the things that's interesting is we interview a lot of major league baseball players. You know, when the overwhelming majority of those interviews take place, it's it got to be place. the off season. No, see, it's the exact opposite. You would think it's the off season. Off season is family time to those guys. I would never want to encroach on that. Mm -hmm. Usually those guys are doing interviews when they're on the road and it's between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. They're in their hotel room in a random city bored out of their mind. They've probably gotten up and gone to the team brunch from, you know, between nine and 11 or whatever. And they're waiting for the first bus to the stadium. And I can't tell you, I bet it's 80% of my interviews with players, um, and, you know, that's just, it's understanding their lifestyle, what makes it easy for them and all that. And usually they've, they've just had a cup of coffee and a good breakfast. So their, their brain's working the way that it should. So, you know, I just, these, these things you learn over the course of time. That's so fascinating. I would never expect that, but good to know. I want to go back to the, the flat tire on the way to, from New York. 
yeah. what, what was your head? What was your mindset like when that happened? It's obviously a situation no one can control, but what, where does your mind go in an immediate crisis? Um, being honest, I never go to crisis. I just, I don't get there. Um, you know, for, for lack of a better term, I, I joke that my give a shit meter is pretty low. Um, <laughs> I, so I just, I, I don't, you know, I, I guess maybe it's the stoicism in me or something like that, but I always, you know, try to think more pensively. Some people get really worked up. Um, you know, I, I think for me, the, the secret is knowing that I, I probably have a very high stress life, you know, and if I let everything that can stress me, stress me, it's not going to turn out well. So I think it's a lot about how you adjust your, your mindset and your, your approach to just realize this could be a lot worse. And, you know, luckily for us, the iPads were charged and the, the kids chilled in the back seat and watched what they needed to watch while we waited for the, uh, you know, the roadside assistance to come and we took care of it. We were back on the road, like, you know, an hour and a half later. So we just, we just rolled with it. But, um, you know, I, I think people have much more problematic things to, to worry about. People have, you know, we have our health, we're, you know, financially sustainable. You know, we have three beautiful kids, like an awesome wife. Like I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose sleep over little things like that. I love it, man. That's a mentality. I think more people should have one thing I wanted to ask. I I would say we, we also live in the age of outrage. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's probably particularly rare when everyone gets frustrated about something and they want to go, you know, yell on Twitter, write a mean Yelp review or something like that. I was, when something's not going my way, I was trying to take a step back and realize, you know, ask myself, is this really that bad? And I think it's, it's served me well historically. How do you go about instilling that in children? (laughs) <laughs> Great question. Um, I, I'll let you know when, when our daughters are teenagers um, to see if it worked. But I, I think they, you know, there's a good line a friend of me, a friend of mine dropped. He said, more is caught than taught. Um, and I think if, if you over emote, if you react, you know, heavily to things, um, then they're more likely to pick that up for you. If you're calm, you're collected, um, you're stoic. You know, I, I think it does serve you well in that and hopefully your, your kids mirror it. But, but I do know, you know, so we have twin six-year-olds and we have a two-year-old as well. And our, our twin six-year-olds are dramatically different people. They, you know, we have a blonde and a brunette, one's pasty white, the other one has like olive skin. Like they are completely different in terms of like their athletic abilities, like one's better at reading, one's better at math. Like, I mean, genetically they have been, you know, they, they, they were in the same womb and they've lived the exact same life. They've spent 99.9% of their lives together. They've shared a bedroom, all this stuff, and they're completely different people. So I do think there is, there is a natural predisposition to being who you are. Um, so, you know, if, if a parent of twins says that, like you almost have to appreciate that not everybody's going to be the same in their ability to, you know, to take on stress and also to, to react to it in a certain way. Twins fascinate me because I think, you know, identical in particular, but obviously this is an identical situation because it's like those two people could be, could, could have the same exact life, but if they make certain decisions that are different, they could go in completely different places. But I'm curious, have you learned anything particularly from having twins? Um, I've definitely learned you can never compare them. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that, that actually has, I, so I'll backtrack a little bit. So I'm, I'm lucky we're, you know, we're 14 years deep on our, on our business and I've seen kids. Um, we have a, a kid right now who's one of the best high school right-handed pitchers in the country. He's super talented and, and is going to be taken very, very high in this draft. He was a little pudgy kid when he was 12. Like I saw a picture of him the other day, it was cracking me up. And he's he's six foot seven, electric arm, great kid. Like he stretched out, totally different than what you expected. I have so many of our big league guys that that didn't even get recruited to play division one sports out of high school. They were crazy late bloomers. So it is it, it, and one of the things that we're realizing in the baseball world is that there actually is probably a lot of advantages to being a late bloomer. You don't get overused at a young age, you don't have all this wear and tear, you know you know, that becomes part of adolescent development. Like there's some blessings there. And so the more and more I've thought about this, the less and less I put pressure on myself as a parent for my kids to, uh, you know, to make up some kind of difference between them and another kid, you know, and, and, and I've seen, we had one daughter that that walked like seven months before the other one come to find out the girl, the one who was bigger walked later, go figure like her center, center of mass was different relative to her base support. So, 
I, I was very, very cognizant of that. Um, and I also know like when our second baby was born, she was born within a couple days of one of our, our real close friends, our, one of our pro guys who, who lives in the same town as us and trains with us. And um, he and his wife had a daughter or excuse me, they had a, they had a son within a week of, of our daughter being born. And what's wild is when they get together to play our, our daughter, Tegan, she has been crazy verbal. Like she was like singing in the back seat. She, she talked so soon, but she was really late to walk. She was just like, not interested. She was chilling. And that kid was like a little maniac. Like he, he ran wild. Like he was walking way before one year. It was, it was nuts, but he didn't say a word. And now they get together and they're both like, peas in the pod, right? They're both running around, having a good time. Um, you know, he's chirping and she's moving around and just, it all sorts itself out. It, it really does. And I've, I've heard that kind of third grade is when, you know, things kind of like, you know, get to where they're going to get. And so I, I just don't put pressure on them. I let them have fun. So, you know, one went to a frozen dance camp today. The other one went to our neighbor's daycare to try it out. Cause she wanted, she heard that a cool playground and, you know, they'll go to gymnastics tomorrow. I, you know, throw a wiffle ball for them in the background. Some nights we do Frisbee, you know, they'll, they'll come over and hit in the cages. They go to a tumbling class. Didn't like soccer. Oh, well, um, they've liked tennis. They'll probably hate it next week. Like it just, it's the secret is always having a million different activities. And, you know, I think giving them a really rich proprioceptive environment and let them, let them develop how they develop. But I'm, I'm not a crazy dad at all. I'm like the other end of the spectrum. It sounds like being open is really important to, having a good uh, parental life. I'm curious how similar it is. You've coached so many athletes and I'm curious if you start to think of th at least the teenage athletes as children in a sense, if you get close to them and how similar that is to parenting. Yeah. Um, you know, th there's a couple of layers to that. I think the first thing I'll tell you is, you know, I always say that, you know, there, there's two things that I'm incredibly humbled by i mean there's there's a lot of things i'm humbled by in the context of what we do in our business but you know one when an athlete trusts us with their career but just as you know on par with that is when a parent trusts us with their impressionable you know 12 to 18 year old child um, because those are important formative years um and and they can develop some really bad habits there or they can develop some really good ones and i've got you know some of the some of the notes that i've saved over the years are notes from parents that say hey you know like what you did for, you know, my son, you know, age 15, it helped him from to, to avoid going down a bad path. And, um, you know, those are the ones that, that really mean a lot to me. Um, and I, I think that's really, really important to appreciate because, you know, our brains are not mature in, until, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's different studies on this. You know, my guess is, you know, somewhere between 25 and, and 30, I, I know some of the stuff I did when I was 25, I'm like, what was wrong with you? What was your, even, even like, you know, what did I invest my money in or whatever? Just, I didn't think it through. Um, and, and now I'm, I'm 40 now. So I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm a lot more pensive and I'm, you know, I still make wrong decisions. Um, and, and you own them obviously better than you did when you were a stubborn 20 year old. But, um, you know, I, I do think that's an important lesson that everybody needs to know is that your, your number one job is to, to be a good role model to these kids, um, that you're training and, you know, to set them up for success and, um, so it drives me bonkers when I see, you know, obviously this isn't a baseball podcast, but in, in the baseball community, there's a lot of tobacco use. You know, there's, there's a lot of major league baseball players on TV and, and, and honestly, a lot of like coaches of high school teams where they'll always have a dip in and it drives me bonkers. You can't say that you care about the kids that you're coaching. If you're coaching with a dip in, because every one of them is looking at you and, and thinking that that's okay, that that's tolerable. And it's, it's not, if it's going to kill you, it's when it will kill you. Like it's next level bad. Um, and so I, I just think about that. And, you know, I think it's, it's our job to really, um, you know, protect our athletes from themselves. And, and a big part of that is modeling good behavior, but um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways we can do that, but I, I, I do think it's a very important consideration. How do we end tobacco use in baseball? Um, you know, it's, it's hard because What's interesting about it is um, my experience with players is you'd be surprised at how many of the players quit when baseball is not taking place. When it's the off season, they don't touch it for, for five months, but the second it's around, it becomes an additional issue. Um, so, you know, I don't think you're going to change the person. I think you have to change the situation. Um, but I, I do respect, you know, people who, who come forward. Kurt Schilling wrote a, a very compelling 
um, blog about it for the Players Tribune a few years ago that talked about, you know, going through chemotherapy for, you know, for the cancer that he got from all those years of dipping, um, you know, how he would never wish it on anybody. And I think, you know, we need more of those players, you know, Tony Gwynn obviously passed away from it. Um, one of the best hitters of all time. So I think having, you know, more people like that come forward, I think will be vitally important. But, but again, I think it comes back to the role models, you know, the, the coaches out there not condoning it, you know, if 16 year old kids shouldn't be dipping on your team. It's illegal for them to get that stuff. If they have it in your presence, you need to make it harder for them to get that. It's no different than someone who wants to stop eating junk food. You get that out of the house, you know, make it so that you have to drive somewhere at 10 o'clock at night if you want that bag of chips. So I think we need to do some of that, but, you know, I, I'm probably, you know, I'm criticizing without offering solutions, but I do think we need to change the situations in which athletes work. Absolutely. So you mentioned under 16 and we, you obviously have been training professionals and you, you coach the, or did strength and conditioning for the team USA under 18 team, which won gold. And I'm curious what the biggest difference is between strength and conditioning for under 18 base, very um, incredible baseball players and the professionals. What's the major differences you see? Um, you know, that, that can go in a lot of different directions. I would say, you know, obviously under 18, there's, there's some foundational principles that need to be put in play, right? It's, you know, the foundation of strength, movement competencies, getting body weight to an appropriate situation on that side of things. And obviously just helping athletes to plan out their yearly calendar, understanding when to push, when to hold back, all those different things. Um, once you get to the professional ranks, you realize that everybody is, or the majority of them are strong. They're powerful. They're fast. A lot of genetic freaks in the mix. So it's much more about the sustainability aspect is how do you make sure they can go out and do what they need to do. So, you know, it's funny. I had this conversation with a, a division one pitcher I evaluated today. Um, and he's a guy who went to a, you know, classic, like show up as a freshman, you know, he's six three one eighty. Hey, we got to get you to two thirty. We need to put on 50 pounds in the next three years. And, you know, sure enough, those guys, they, thrive as freshmen, right? You go from 180 to 205, you feel like a new man, you're throwing harder, everything's great. And you know what often happens to those guys? Sophomore and junior year, they stagnate. They actually probably get worse. They usually get way more banged up um, because what worked to take them from kind of underwhelming to average isn't necessarily gonna take them from average to elite. Um, and it's because, you know, they, they start lo losing some of their movement competencies or the window of adaptation just gets smaller and smaller. There's just, um, a lot of different, uh, you know, things that you need to work on as people develop a higher training age. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we'll work on with those athletes is we, we start throwing the med ball a lot more. We look at what they're doing, their throwing program. We, we look on the mobility side of things more. We hit single leg work and, you know, all those different patterns, you know, get on a really good arm care program that they just don't get, you know, in many cases at the, the younger levels, even into like their first couple of years of college. But, um, you know, we, we know at the highest level, you don't make your money unless you're on the field. So that's the, the name of the game. And I think there are a lot of strength addition coaches that have a really hard time not being the center of attention, right? What, what happens when an athlete's only lifting, you know, once or twice a week, you know, it's maybe not as, as thrilling from a career standpoint to have really good warm ups every day, but you know what, it's, it's vitally important for making sure those guys are out there. And then, you know, you take on a much, you know, heavier, more important role in terms of your off season with them. Um, yeah, I, th I think the other thing too, I'll just say difference from the amateur versus the professional ranks is, you know, there, there's what you know versus what you can implement. That's a, you know, Mike Boyle line, which I think is pretty accurate. You know, there's an assumption that you just, you know, you roll in and you wave a magic wand and everybody, you know, does exactly what you want. In reality that, you know, at the highest level, a lot of these athletes are, they're compensated very well. Uh, many of them have developed, you know, training principles that are important to them, you know, with the folks that they've worked with or things that they've, you know, kind of figured out on their own. Um, over the course of time. So you, you need to listen, you need to interact with them. You get, need to get to know them. They need, they need to know and like you before they trust you. Um, and so for a while, it might be one of mine, one of yours. And, you know, sometimes you might feel like you're playing with the time for the playing for the tie with them, but you're building a relationship that long-term allows you to, to figure out the answers together. And um, I, I think that's a, a very, very important thing for a lot of the younger coaches out there to, to recognize. One thing that I notice from hearing you talk is just a, a complete lack of ego that your way is the best way you're talking about giving these players, you know, let them do their own program. And the way you're approaching things seems to be without much ego. Where does that come from? 
Um, I, if there's one thing I've learned, it's that, you know, this game can humble you really quick. I, this game, that could be baseball. That could be the strength edition field, anything like that. Um, you know, and, um, I remember Bill Hartman many, many years ago, dropped a line. It was something like, oh, you think you're strong. Well, somewhere there's a 120 pound Chinese girl warming up with your max, you know, and it was, it was a great line. Um, just because, you know, there's always someone out there that's, that, that's gunning for you or, you know, something like that. So you just, you have to, you know, as an athlete, you have to be aware that someone's, you know, there's, there's a guy on the bench who wants to take your job. And I, I think for us, that's, that served us well in terms of trying to stay ahead of the research and be cutting edge and progressive with what we do, you know, with our training. But, um, you know, there's a, there's certainly a lot to be learned across all industries with that. Mm. One thing that one book that you've repeatedly said is one of your favorites is thinking fast and slow by Daniel Kahneman. Why is this book, why did this book impact you so, so strongly? Yeah. I, you know, thinking fast and slow is actually, um, you know, it's funny. I, I've been told about it a long time ago and I read it I'm not sure I ever got all the way through it. I'm not sure I was maybe mature enough to, to recognize it. Um, and then, you know, I came back to it actually in the past year and, and really enjoyed it. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a long one. I want to say it's like 19 hours as an audio book and, probably about three years as a, as a hard copy book, but um, it's actually caught a lot of, um, I mean, it, it's, it's gotten a lot of love in professional baseball. It's, it's very well known in in front office analytics circles. And it, you know, really it's, it's about understanding that, you know, what you see at a first look might not be what's the case. And, you know, maybe the best example I can give you is in baseball. Like, you know, you can look at a player's batting average and you know, he'd be hitting 250 and that 250 it doesn't necessarily tell you everything about like what's, what's gone into it. Right. So you could hit 250, which is basically one for four. And you might've hit four balls, 110 miles an hour, right on the screws. And three of them just happened to go right at hitters. And, and 95% of the time, those balls might've been, you know, doubles or, you know, singles or whatever it is, but you really only got rewarded for one. So you, you have to dig a little bit deeper and, you know, look at what, what the probabilities would have been by that same token. You'll see people that, you know, that are hitting 250 that struck out, you know, three times and hit one like little nubber, you know, that barely stayed fair, that became a single. And, and so, you know, outcomes are not necessarily indicative of processes. And I think that's something the book, you know, really, really looks at. So I think as a, as a society, we look really, really heavily at outcomes, but we don't necessarily check on processes nearly as well. And that served me well as an employer, as a dad, you know, like if, if my daughter, you know, spills a bowl of food on the floor, I could get really, really mad. Or I could say, Hey, you know what? She was being a great girl. She was helping to clean up the table. She was bringing it over to the sink and she, she made a mistake. You know, it's, it's a bad outcome, but not a bad process. The last thing I'm going to do is yell and scream. Um, so we just have to be able to differentiate between those two things. What are the most important processes for your day-to-day -day life today? Um, schedule um, across the board. You know, you just, you, you can't fly by the seat of your pants um, with, with the things I have going on. And, and certainly as a parent, you know, if you fly by the seat of your parents, you're, you know, you got a kid who's at gymnastics that, that you or your wife forgot to pick up or something like that. Um, so I think for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very big. I think it was the extreme ownership and they talk about structure sets you free. I do really, really well with structure. Um, and I think people that don't have it aren't productive. Um, and so for me, it's, it's vitally important. I think that's, that's a, that's a key principle, you know, for me is, is structure slash scheduling. I think a second one is, is empowerment. And I think a lot of people would call that delegation, but um, I think empowerment is a much more important way to look at it because I've had people who delegated, but didn't empower. And when you delegate and you don't empower, what you wind up doing is coming back to it hours later and saying, "Never mind, I'll just do it." Um, and and I'm, I'm a big believer, you know. And this is taking a long time to get to is hiring really really good people, um, empowering them, you know, and 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 praising them when they do a good job. And that's something I've had to learn, you know. In the past, I was the guy that maybe played the pessimistic card a little bit, where I would always try to find things going wrong. So um, you know, I, I try to do a much better job of you know, shooting that text message to an employee at the end of the day, Hey, you handled that situation. Great. Thanks for all you do. Um, or, you know, leaving a $50 bill inside someone's computer at the end of the day saying, I know today was a busy eval day. You crushed it. You know, those things it sounds crazy to say, but it, it goes a long way. Um, because people, people hear what's wrong with the world way too often, particularly in this world of baseball where, you know, you know, a hitter that might fail 70% of the time is one of the best of all time. Like people don't need more failure and more negativity in their life. They need people who are going to lift them up and, that's something I've had to, had to work on and had to learn and, you know, trying, trying to practice it. 
you mentioned you weren't always like that. What happened or what changed to make you more of a person who empowered? Um, I think, you know, I think it was a lot of things. I think, um, you know, certainly the process of becoming a parent, you know, definitely plays into that. I think, you know, even like, um, staff turnover employees move on and, you know, you do exit interviews, like what, what could we have done to make things better? Or even just direct feedback from employees who have been with us for an extended period of time. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to have, you know, my, my business partner, Pete here in Massachusetts, uh, was actually my college roommate, believe it or not, our first, first year at Babson. And, you know, he did an MBA and Pete, you know, I think does a really good job on the soft skills um, of understanding, you know, how to interact with employees. I, I'm not, I'm not by any means a, a HR guy, um, and, but I do have a lot of people that, you know, for one way or another report to me, whether it's at, you know, our facilities or, you know, the Yankees organization. So I think it's important that I, I do just as much reading on leadership as I do about, you know, training or business or finance or any of that stuff. Were there any impactful books? I know you mentioned uh, extreme ownership, but any impactful books on leadership that come to mind for someone who's trying to become a better leader? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. I, I think never eat alone was a great one that I recommend to a lot of people. It's Keith Ferrazzi. Um, that's a little bit more of a networking uh, book, but I think a lot of the principles, you know, you can definitely apply um, to, to leadership stuff. And then, um, Certainly Legacy by James Carr um, was outstanding. Um, it's all about the All Blacks and, and what they did to kind of turn things around during you know, one of their down periods. Legacy, you know, for me is probably the best audiobook I've ever listened to. It's just a really, really good read with, you know, each chapter has a really, you know, strong principle um, that I think everybody be served to, to listen to. So that's me. That for me is one of those ones you go back to and, you know, listen to multiple times. And Legacy by... What's the uh, author? It's, it's James Carr. It's spelled K-E-R-R, but it's pronounced Carr, I believe. Awesome. I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah. Um, one thing that I want to talk to you about was training with Corey Kluber. You know, I was reading and doing research prior to this conversation and from one website said, you two began training together when Kluber was an unknown minor leaguer who almost no one envisioned ever winning a Cy Young. Um, and so I'm curious what you saw in... Corey Kluber that led you to start working with him? Um, you know, the first thing I would say is I think everybody, similar to maybe some of our other discussions, is everyone's successful for, for different reasons. Um, you know, I, I, I tr certainly try not to overstate my importance in all this. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the really pronounced important things that, that Corey did not long after we first met was um, he switched from predominantly four-seam fastballs to two-seam fastballs. And, you know, it really changed him as a pitcher. So really the credit for that goes actually to Ruben Diabla, who is now an assistant pitching coach for the Cleveland Indians at the time. He was in their minor league system and he and Corey have had a, a great relationship for a long time. But Ruben was the one that encouraged him to, to go to the two seam. And that made a big difference in his, his ability to, you know, locate his fastball. I think, you know, where we, you know, came in was introducing him to new throwing programs, different ways of working out. But if there's one thing I'd say that stood out to me both then and now about Corey was um, attention to detail. Um, and, and, and a little bit of the stoicism we talked about, obviously he's known for it on the mound, but what I liked about Corey was he was never selling out for the flavor of the week. You know, he never, you know, was like printing out like something he saw on Twitter and bringing it in and saying, can we try this? Let's do this instead. And he wasn't jumping around. He was just very consistent. Um, he was pensive and, and I think in the way that he, he took on new things, you know, certainly deliberate in the way that he executed them and also pensive in the way that he, he evaluated whether or not they worked. Um, you know, so, so Corey's known as a, maybe a quiet guy, but he's actually probably the best communicator I've ever trained. Um, and we've had a lot of really good dialogues over the years and, um, so yeah, was, we're going on 11 years, you know, of working together, but, um, yeah, I, I do think there's something to be said about just being consistent, being very habit forming. Um, and for a long time, actually, I did stuff distance based with Corey, where I would see him at the start of an off season and he would live remotely and I would send him programs. But what was always interesting is without fail, one week before his new program was due, I'd get a you know text or an email from him saying, hey, I'm due on the seventh for a new program. Here's what feels good. Here's what I think we need to change. And I can't tell you how many guys like will tell me like the night before, you know, like they just forget to tell you. And he was always, you know, a few chess moves ahead and always really cognizant of that stuff. And I think over the years, we did a really good job of, um, of refining the program. We're still doing it. Um, 
you know, in terms of, you know, how it changed when he, you know, had the highest workload in baseball in 2016 and um, just being able to adjust as we work through stuff. So it's been a, it's been a really good working relationship, but, you know, Corey's a stud. He makes me, he makes me look smart, way smarter than I am. <laughs> Do you ever look at programs you wrote 10 years ago and say, oh man, I would have done this so differently. I would have done X, yeah. Y, or Z differently. And how do you deal with that mentally? Um, I, I mean, I, I don't put it this way. If I went back and I looked at him, I would do a face palm. And I know that's the case, but um, I think that's a level of humility you have to have. Um, you know, I would even say that about programs I've written five years ago or one year ago. We're just, wow. we're just constantly evolving. We're finding better ways to do things, whether that's different evaluation approaches, different programming approaches, different ways to coach certain exercises, different ways to, to, to layer them within the session um, or, you know, creating context and what we're trying to do from a skill development standpoint with our hitting and our pitching coaches. So yes, it's, it's a, it's a constantly moving target. Hmm. And, and does it stress you out? I mean, to our, to our point earlier, no, because uh, you know, I think you, you just have to, you have to be able to sleep at night because you're putting your best foot forward every day with, with who you are right now. And I think you also have to look at, like I'll, I'll, I'll sound arrogant in saying this. Like, I don't think anybody delivers like a baseball development experience in the country. Like we do, um, you know, we've leveraged synergy really, really heavily. Like, like think about this, like we're, we're a small business, you know, our, our Florida facility has 15 soon to be 16 or 17 employees. Our Massachusetts facility has half that. And we're competing with, you know, three to $5 billion organizations for athletes during the off season. They have the choice to go and train with their organizations for free in the off season. And instead they pay, move their families across the country and train with us. Why do they do that? It, yeah. You could make the argument that, you know, it's, they don't want to, it's like living with mom when you go and you, you train with your organization and stuff. Well, you know, I, I would say it has a lot more to the fact that because we are a little bit smaller like that, it makes us a little bit more nimble. We're, we're able to pivot more quickly. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's like turning a small boat as opposed to a giant barge, right? Um, and I think what it also allows us to do is have a lot of communication across our staff. That synergy is really, really important. Where our manual therapist, our physical therapist, our pitching coach, our you know, front desk person, our strength and conditioning coach, all these people are able to get in the same room and have a conversation about what's working, what isn't, how we all need to collectively pivot. And, and I can tell you, this is something that has been the, the, the feedback we've gotten a lot from a lot of like rehabbing big league veterans, you know, guys who've got seven or eight years in the show and then they have, you know, a shoulder surgery and they're trying to come back and, and do it. That's the thing that they, they couldn't appreciate before until they came to our facility is, wow, all you guys talk, none of you hate each other. Nobody's territorial. Nobody's fighting for a promotion. There's none of that. It's all about the athlete. It's their show. You know, we're all there to do whatever he needs to do. Hey, if this guy needs to lift two days a week instead of four to get better, I don't care. I'll, I'll write a program that's less involved and, you know, shift more of his workload over to the pitching guy. And Hey, this is a guy that needs more manual therapy and less therapeutic exercise. Our, our PTs are fine with him going to do some soft tissue work with, you know, with my business partner, Shane, or, you know, our massage therapist, Chris, it's just, there can't be egos. Everybody's got to always have the athlete first, you know, cause the, and, and the customer is, is always right. So they got to be the, the priority. What do you do to instill that in the team? You hire it. You know, I, I can't teach you to be a good person, but I can evaluate it. And, and you wonder why we, we, we hire so much from our internship program. What's an internship? Someone who comes in with a good resume, um, hopefully with a letter of recommendation that says they're a good human being and all that stuff too. And then we invest in them heavily from a knowledge and experience standpoint. And we use those three to five months that, that are, they're at our facility coaching to evaluate whether they're a good cultural fit for our business. I've had some really, really smart interns that we didn't hire because we didn't want to spend time with them. We were, we were ready for them to go by the end of it, even though they were really competent coaches, we just didn't think they'd fit in well in the staff lounge. We thought they'd, you know, say the wrong things. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd rather have someone that needs a little bit more time, you know, on the, the, you know, the skill development side of things, the coaching competency, that side of things. And I'll, and I'll take that time and with them, if I feel like they're a really good cultural fit for us, um, as long as they've shown enough, you know, of, of an ability to get their foot in the door and, and impress us in other ways. What are some of the things that you did when you were just starting out 14 years ago that separated you back then? Ooh, Ooh that's a good one. Um, you know, back in 2007, I, I do think we had some first mover advantage. Um, you know, I had the background in 
taking care of my own shoulder because of my tennis career. Um, and so when I, when I started working with a couple of baseball guys, I realized pretty quickly that it was a very underserved population. You know, it was kind of like the, here's the football program. And then the other one was like, baseball players don't need to lift weights, just do some bands and you'll be fine. And, you know, we found kind of a happy medium between the two and, and we're able to, to push guys pretty hard while keeping in mind, you know, their structural issues and, you know, their, the functional you know, demands of their sport and all that stuff. So when we started getting going with this baseball strength edition concept, it was, it was very foreign. Like, you know, Mike Boyle was, you know, training hockey guys and you had like Joe DeFranco doing the football, like combine prep stuff, but there wasn't a really like specialized niche world. Um, and it, that was 2007 and it, it's taken off a lot more where you see guys that just work with like a volleyball program or, you know, even you go to universities, there was always like, you know, football strength coaches, but historically there'd be like four or five, you know, like assistant strength coaches at these big universities, all they'd all carry like, you know, three to four teams themselves. Even when I was at UConn and, you know, in Oh three to Oh five, um, just, I remember looking around and, you know, most of those, those coaches had, you know, four teams. Um, and nowadays, like you see a lot of baseball only strength coaches, hockey only strength coaches, you know, even at like UConn now, like women's basketball has their own strength coach. Men's basketball has their own strength coach. Football has their own strength coach. Um, you know, these, these larger revenue sports are all getting it. Um, so the industry has become way more specialized. And I think we were in the private setting, at least we were at the, the front of that. Um, and, and first mover advantage was, was key for, you know, allowing us to grow our brand and, and, but also just being honest, like looking around at like a lot of people who became our competition in the, the seven to eight years after that is like, sometimes they were like our former interns, which was, which was kind of entertaining. We, we cheered them on obviously, cause it's more nationwide and stuff, but, um, you know, we always, we always had a leg up to realize that we were, we were kind of like the ones that were moving the needle while everyone else were, you know, we're just trying to play catch up a little bit. And we we've tried to continue that, that presence by staying at the forefront. What's something that 10 years ago you weren't talking about or that the industry wasn't talking about that today is something that you're thinking about on a, a daily or weekly basis. Yeah. I mean, so 10 years ago was 2011. You know, I look back at our baseball programs the first couple of years and we, we probably made a lot of the mistakes that, you know, I kind of alluded to, and, you know, you take a bunch of 18 year old college freshmen, you just get them crazy strong. Cause I think we were powerlifting programs that threw in some arm care and we maybe didn't coach them in the right positions. You know, we, you know, we figured, you know, it was just going to come out in the wash if we made it strong. And so I, nowadays, I, I think I'm less emotionally attached to lifting than, I, than I've ever been before. It's a means to an end. Um, and my job is to improve people's quality of life, keep them healthy and allow them to perform their sports. So I really don't care what the method is, as long as it give or gives us the desired outcome. So I think this, this discussion of how strong is strong enough has probably been the biggest methodology, maybe discussion that's, that's changed from 2011 to 2021. Um, you know, and I, this off season was actually a really important testing point where, where it was a shorter major league season last year. So you got a lot of guys that came back strong. So when you have like a pro baseball player that comes back and pulls 455 for five reps easy on their first day of the off season on a trap bar, it's like, all right, we're strong enough. Let's train some other stuff. And so we, we actually did that with a lot of our guys last year and the results were really, really good. Um, so I, I think that's something I'm, I'm very mindful also dealing with some different players who have, you know, as they've aged, who have played better, lighter. Um, I think there were at times in the past where maybe I was, you know, a little bit more emotionally attached to, to, you know, training, you know, loading them heavy more often than they needed to. Um, so I've, I've taken a step back on a lot of that. We've, we've trained them you know, harder with respect to medicine ball stuff and using the Proteus machine and Versapoli, just, just training them in different capacities, being a better coach of movement than just lifting. Um, so we've, we've, we've definitely adjusted over the years where, you know, don't get me wrong, we still lift heavy stuff, but, you know, I think we were mindful of how much we lift step heavy stuff and who much, how much, who, who we do it with. Hmm. And what's something in 2026 you think will be getting a lot more play and a lot more conversation in the professional realm? Ooh, that's an interesting one. I mean, I think, 
you know, certainly technology is, is, is where this is all going. Right. You know, um, and, you know, I, you know, obviously the, all the artificial intelligence discussions and all that, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing stuff with like virtual reality with, you know, simulated at bats with glasses and, and a lot of that stuff where it may allow athletes to get a lot of game speed reps, um, without necessarily beating their bodies up for it. Um, you know, I, I still think, you know, probably sports medicine is the space in which we need to be the most kind of cognizant of advances happening. Um, you know, we're, we're still in a situation where, you know, as an example, one of the big things right now in, in the baseball communities, we're seeing more UCL repairs with internal brace. So historically, if you tore the ligament on the inside of your elbow, you would have Tommy John surgery. They would take a graft you know, of a tendon and use it to replace the ligament. You'd be out for an average return is about 14 months. Um, so a long time to miss. And, you know, um, Dr. Dr. Jeff Dugas was a, a super bright um, surgeon, um, brought a procedure from a, a you know, basically a, an ankle procedure with an internal brace and applied it to the elbow and found that certain tears could be managed with that and it can be brought back much quicker. And it's in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's re revolutionized the way that we treat some elbow injuries. Um, but it's still, you know, not right for everybody and everything. So, you know, we're looking at a scenario where, where eventually we get a different kind of graph where some, you know, external implement it enables to do it. Hey, can we take some of these internal braces and use it on a shoulder? You know, beyond that, are we going to, you know, have a better shoulder replacement, you know, for when all these CrossFitters are, are, you know, 70 years old and all this overhead pressing catches up to them. We're going to see a lot more change because we have a lot of people who are really active later into adulthood. So I, I, I think a lot of the sports medicine initiatives are going to be really, really vitally important for us, you know, in terms of allowing people to, to maintain that level of activity, you know, as they age and as lifespan increases. I think the other thing too, at the other end of the spectrum is I'm curious to see if things get better with youth sport injuries. You know, I think we're being a little bit more mindful of, you know, the importance of not avoiding early sports specialization. You know, you're seeing more pitch count guidelines in, initiated in little league and all that stuff. Um, we're still seeing probably way too much specialization. So I'm, I'm intrigued to see if a lot of the injuries that we're seeing in, in college and professional athletes that are probably happening secondary to, to overuse at the young levels. I'm curious to see if they're going to level off, um, you know, or if they, they actually start to improve in the years ahead as some of these, you know, societal initiatives take place. But, um, you know, I think it's all going to be sports medicine related in one way or another. I'm surprised sleep wasn't, something on either end of the spectrum that that was discussed how has the conversation around sleep evolved in the baseball community over the past 10 years um you know i think it has i think it has across all professional sports um you know i, I think that's that's also one of those like we know sleep is important it's more about you know you're not necessarily going to change the person but can you change the situation right can you change the caffeine consumption can you change the bedtime ritual can you change you know, the stress level, whatever it is. So I, I still come back to, you know, we know that's important. I don't think there's a whole lot of innovation that's going to take place necessarily there. Um, you know, that that's going to be better than what we have. I, I hope I'm wrong. Maybe I will be. Um, but I think we have a lot of sleep hygiene things that, you know, we've, we've seen athletes who know how to do it, right? We hear about like, you know, JJ Watt, and LeBron, and some of these guys, you know, trying to get 12, 13 hours of sleep a day. Um, you know, they've shown that it can be done if you make it a priority. Um, and, and I've certainly seen athletes that have been able to do that, but, you know, I just don't think we're necessarily there as an entire industry because a lot of these younger athletes just don't get it yet. Hmm. That's fascinating. And is that difficult having a conversation with a young athlete about sleep being important when it's easy to take advantage of your youth in some respect? Yeah. I mean, everybody's invincible until they're not right. <laughs> so I, th I think you have to you know, with a lot of those athletes, you got to pick the lowest hanging fruit. And, um, you know, that's certainly one of them, but you know, the nutrition side of things is great as well. I mean, I, I have all these athletes, you know, they, they walk in a 17 year old kid and you, you say, you want to pitch in the big leagues, don't you? Like, absolutely. It's my number one goal. I'm like, if I, if I told you to eat dirt, would you, would you, and you, if it meant you could get to the big leagues, would you eat dirt? And they're like, yeah, definitely. I was like, so why don't you eat vegetables? Why don't you go to bed on time? Like, why are you staring at your cell phone at 1am? Why are you playing video games all night? Like, people, their, their actions of today don't align with their goals of tomorrow. And I think that's a really important, um, you know, thing to understand. And, you know, if, if you can go down, down your diet log and label, you know, food as either crap or not crap, and you want to be leaner, stronger, faster, healthier, whatever it may be. And, you know, there's stuff on that list that still reads as crap, like you probably shouldn't be eating it. So people just aren't ready to make that level of commitment. 
What's the most rewarding part about coaching an athlete? Um, you, you know, it's, I don't know if there's just one, you know, there's yeah. a lot. I mean, I think it's, it's remarkably rewarding when you have an athlete who's been through a lot of injuries, who gets to come back and, and play and, you know, they appreciate, you know, what they had that they lost. I think that's really, really big. I think, you know, I've seen kids who were cut from their high school teams who become division one athletes and then, you know, professional athletes, you know, that's obviously super rewarding. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of different ways you go with that. I think, you know, one thing that gets overlooked too is, you know, when we, when we use the gym as a way to, um, you know, whether it's training for baseball or whatever to, to establish, you know, these, these lifelong habits, um, for exercise, we, you know, we want these people to, to be working out for their forever, not just, you know, while they're playing baseball. So if you can kind of make the, the gym a social place, you know, they start to just appreciate it as part of the process. I love it, man. Um, before we wrap things up, I'd love to ask about just someone pursuing the highest version of themselves, whether that's mentally, physically, emotionally, what advice do you have to that person? Let's say they're 22 years old. I'm curious where you would, where you would direct your energy to tell them what to do. Yeah. I, I think you're a, you're a product of the, you know, the, the people that you spend the most time around. Um, and I, I know that's a, the hackneyed expression. I'm sure I've heard it from, you know, every inspirational speaker on the planet and all the self-help books and everything like that. But if you got to get around good people. Um, and and I, I think that's one thing I've been really fortunate and, and they haven't been the same people necessarily all the time. Right. Like I've, I had people that I was around in grad school who were, who were awesome and, you know, mentored me and pushed me. I've, I've had people around me in the writing community who had challenged me to, to work harder. Um, you know, even just, you know, coaches and teachers over the years and, you know, my wife now, my business partners now, like if you're not getting toxic people out of your life, you, you're just not committed you know, and, and that's, that's easier said than done. Obviously, sometimes you need to separate yourselves from those relationships, but, you know, I just, I, I don't really have time for people that, that drag me down. Um, and that's something I think I've done a good job of over the years is, you know, not even letting those people into my life, never even getting to the point where I need to have those discussions about like, Hey, you and I, we're, we're not a good match. Um, you know, so I, it's, it's been really, really good. Um, and I think the the nice thing too, is when you have that close circle, you have people that, you know, you can, you can call, when you're, you know, you're second guessing something or whatever. So like, you know, I have, I have a collection of gym, you know, owners and things like that around the country. Like I can call Pat Rigsby. I can call Luca Hosevar. I can reach out to Mark Fisher, you know, Todd Dirk and these people that I know that actually can like, they, they deserve a seat at the table. Like, you know, for our business, like it doesn't do me a whole lot of good to call somebody who's been in business for six months. And it's just like, you know, trying to get the first couple people in the door. Like, I want to talk to people who've been in business, you know, 15 years, um, who, who can kind of like speak my language. So I've, I think that's something that's really, really big is building that network. And just as importantly, pulling people out of that network, if they're not, you know, helping you to be the best version of yourself. What happens if you are a, a toxic player? comes across your facilities and, and wants to start training with you, how do you know when to say goodbye to that person, when to say we can improve this person? You know, that's a really interesting point. The thing I'll tell you is those, those guys generally have a way of weeding themselves out really, really quickly. Um, and I know that's not a great answer necessarily, but there's a little bit of a velvet rope around our facilities. When you're, when you're a paying customer, if you're not willing to work hard, like why bother? So I tend to be very direct with them. Um, to be honest, it's very rarely, at least in our facilities, on the professional side of things. It's very rarely on the college side of things. It actually tends to be more toxicity among the, the high school slash parent relationship. A lot of times you'll have a kid who's there because their dad is forcing it on them. Um, so one of the things that I do, uh, to be honest, I, I don't do nearly as much high school uh, evaluations now. Um, but whenever I have an evaluation with like a 15 year old kid and, you know, I ask, I'm asking him questions about himself or something like that. And the dad's interrupting. I stop it. I say, listen, I know you're really, really well intentioned. This is not going to work in this way. I, I, it's very important that he or she answers the questions because this is like a game of telephone is if I get the information from you, it's probably convoluted in some way. And it's not, you know, coming exactly from the source. Now that you're not going to be allowed on the training floor once we're actually coaching. So if you're not going to be out there and I haven't developed rapport with him to actually coach him, then we're not going to be in a good place. So I want to make sure this starts off on the right foot. So you draw very meticulous boundaries with parents. Um, you, you, you explain to them how they can be supportive, um, but you, you don't let them dictate the flow of it. That Those have been more of our issues, to be honest, um, over the years. And um, you just have to draw guidelines of, of what's okay and what isn't. 
I love it. Absolutely beautifully said. Thank you, Eric, for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time. And yeah. where can people find more from you? Sure. Uh, it's just Eric Cressy at Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, and then uh, my website's ericcressy.com. There's a you know blog and newsletter and podcasts and all that stuff too. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome.